and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech, the chance for you to ask us any questions by using hashtag Ask GMBN Tech down in the comments of any video, and then we can pick it up on a show like this, can't we, Owen? Yeah, and try and answer it. Try our best. Yeah. And I believe you've got the first question. What yeah, that's right. We've got a fun question here from Adam. He's asking, what happens if I fill an inner tube with sealant? Um, will it protect from punctures? Um, okay, in, in short, not really, no. So first thing that's going to be a factor is that quite a lot of tubular sealants aren't really designed to work with butyl inner tubes. Now you get some sealants that work well with latex tubes, so you could do that. But this is the kind of, I guess, the main point, is that whilst the tubular sealant will work in rabbit ears, work in tubes, it'll only work for kind of like thorns and the smaller sort of like pin style sort of like holes. What it won't help with is the bigger pinch flats. Um, and that's because the, the material inside a tube has got, well, often they've got talc inside. Um, so that's gonna limit how the tubular sealant can work. Um, and also the tubular sealant is gonna really struggle to, to seal a long slit in a, uh, in a tube because the tube material is different to the inside of a tire. So the short answer is sort of yes, but not really. So yeah, there you go. Okay, so my question from MTB Aficionado. Oh, are you now? Um, what happens to pros bikes after they've used them? Uh, good question. Depends on the bike, depends on the sponsor, depends on how pro the rider is. Very I true, think. Yeah. I mean, if a pro is on a prototype, um, they ain't keeping that. That's definitely going back to uh, the brand itself. Um, and there's different levels of deals out there that I'll talk about. So um, effectively, you could be you could be a shop sponsor. They could give you a bike and then and take it back at the end of the year and it will be effectively a long-term loan and then they'll just sell the bike on as an ex-demo or as an ex-team bike. Um, some level up you might be sponsored by a shop or a brand who will give you the bike and then you can sell it at the end of the year. Um, they'll just negate it as an asset and you get to you know bump up your salary effectively. Um, and some of them, um, some people might even have to just buy their bike at a discounted rate and then they can sell on themselves uh, just to make their money back and everyone is kind of cost neutral effectively um, but pro pros what are you saying because you've spanned for a few pro pros on the UCI yeah um, are they giving them back um, I think it depends mm. uh, so I think some people will have maybe like a practice bike and a race bike and the race bike will be sort of maybe depending if there's no model changes might become the practice bike for the next year so they get to keep mm. a bike I think it it's all down to lots of secret deals. And unfortunately, Absolutely. especially mountain biking, unlike the road where there's like a minimum salary, at least for the male pros, there still isn't for women, which is bonkers. Hashtag UCI, mm. sort it out. Um, so I think it just depends. There's a lot of kind of like secret deals done and I think it really depends. Um, yeah, and I know a lot of uh, females that I used to race with who were proper sponsored by big top brands uh, that were given a sort of a fleet of bikes that they could sell at the end of the year yeah. because uh, yeah, maybe they didn't get paid as much as the men, but it made their salary a little bit more even. I guess one final factor is that you will see pros selling bikes of varying kind of levels of pro. Um, and sometimes it can be really cool to get like a mm. little slice of history if they're a really fast racer or a really good deal on a race bike a that really you know is fast. Bike. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not much. But I guess the, the sort of the caveat is always that it's a race bike, so it's not going to be used kind of really lightly and nicely and only when the sun's out and it's only in nice and warm <laughs> conditions uh, and it will have been jet washed to within an inch of its life. Possibly. There are some good mechanics out there that I would actually want to buy a team bike because I know it's been looked after more than your average rider. And I've, in fact, I've bought Sally Bingham's old bike. It was a Canyon Exceed back in the day when that was like... Marathon World Champ. Yes, yeah, there we yeah. Go. one of the most decorated. And her bike, she gave me loads of spares with it and it was absolutely on point. So sometimes you can have a winner, sometimes maybe not. Right, next question we've got from Odin Fine Art Creations. I think I'm hopefully pronouncing that correctly. Just been getting back into riding. I've picked up an older bike, 2015 Norco Storm 7.1. Uh, now, this question is subjective, but what would be some notable upgrades that this person could make? Mm. Thoughts? I mean, I'm looking at it right now. You've got hydraulic brakes on there, which is good. I, uh, you know, if it was mechanical, I'd upgrade that. But you've got hydraulic. They're 160 discs. If you didn't, if you didn't think you were getting enough power from your uh, discs, you 
could potentially move up to a bigger rotor size. That's always a nice um, upgrade, especially if you need to replace the disc soon anyway. It does give you more stopping power for a lot less money than new brakes. Yeah, I think for me, that's a, that's a really good point, yeah, because it's just the, the new rotors, which you might need anyway, and the adapters, and maybe new pads. I think for me, drivetrain is a, is a biggie. And yeah. now you can get some really good 1x12, 1x11 drivetrains mm. that aren't going to break the bank. Whereas in 2015, He's on, on a three by nine right oh, now. Oh right, yeah, three okay. Three by nine. So yeah, you could if your drivetrain needs replacing anyway, is going to cost you a whole new drivetrain. So yeah, why go not? go one by definitely. One but, by. No, it'd be really good, and mm. you get like a wide range cassette. It could be really good. I Depending think on I looked at spacing. some online retailers recently where you could get without replacing the HG cassette, which is a sort of stumbling block for some twelve speed systems. Mm. You could get a kind of Sunrace cassette which is 12 speed, even though it's on a HG. So there's some kind of wizardry happening there. Um, but great option to have, because it means you don't need a new wheel set. Uh, and then, yeah, you can get some 12 speed components relatively cheaply now. Mm, yeah. So I think it was under 200 quid, and you could go one by 11, so, um, yeah, or one by sure. 12, sorry. You might have to look at crank and chain ring, but yeah. Yeah, That'd potentially. Be my upgrade. Yeah. Um, or potentially a dropper post. So uh, you might have to get an externally rooted dropper post on that. But if you're using that bike for trail and you're finding that maybe the saddle gets in your way, get an externally rooted dropper post. And I think that would be a banging upgrade. Yeah, and let us know when you have done those upgrades mm. because then we can feature the bike. That'd be really exciting. Or upload it to top mods. Perfect, uh, for yeah. For the show, that would be great. So my next question from ExoSevy17, who says, is it true that for people with long torsos, a bike with a size higher than recommended is better and vice versa for shorter? I mean, it kind of depends here. There's a lot of factors going on. I see what you're trying to say because someone of the same, say we were the same height, uh, but if my body was longer than you, then I would probably want a longer reach. So sizing up can can give you a longer reach. It also gives you a lot of other things that you may or may not want um, if you were the same height. So you might get an added stack height, some brands do. Um, some like Merida, the 160 comes with low stack heights uh, so that people can choose whatever length they want in a front triangle effectively without sort of altering that stack height. But you would need a heck of a lot of spaces if you're going yeah, up I guess, to I guess a, an XL, for example. I guess it, the, the problem is that bikes have been designed with a kind of like a proportional people growing at a certain mm. certain aspect ratio of all their, like their leg length growing equal to their torso. In reality, no one's really like that. I think, I guess it kind of like, it can swing, but I, I, a bike brand, yeah. I can't remember who it was, but was saying there was a big push for women-specific bikes and there was like a very weird morphed geometry mm. that they were like, oh yeah, all women are like this. But then actually when they did, this big bike brand did research, actually lots of shorter men were the same in terms of they had longer legs and shorter torsos. So I think, yeah, I think it is about your proportions. And I think the reach and, so reach and stack is this kind of nominal, like sort of front centre and height of, of the frame, not so much where the bars are. So it's a little tricky to gauge, but it gives you a fair comparison between lots of frames. Um, it does mean that you also have to factor in seat angles. So I think it's really easy for lots of people in, in the bike industry to get obsessed, or lots of consumers as well, to get obsessed by head angle and by, oh, the reach on this is this. Mm. But that doesn't necessarily factor in seat post angle and how if you've got really long legs, well, actually, well, that means that seat angle will move you away so it will grow your top tube or effective reach as well so yeah yeah I be think, careful i'd say yeah. <laughs> just sizing up geometry is more complicated than just one number and one size um yeah i think modern geometry is pretty spot on go with what the manufacturer recommends these days um i think it was a very old sort of thinking with older bikes that we wanted to size up to make them fit us when things were a little bit shorter back in the early yeah. night well, noughties uh we've got another great question here um i'm normally very happy with my setup this is suspension related. Um, it's quite cold at the moment. It is. We're not sure where you are, uh, Mojo MTB 101, but it's minus 10 centigrade where he is, which is quite fresh to be fair. Uh, his <laughs> suspension feels tired and lethargic. Is it just his imagination or is there a reason for it and what can I do about it? Both fork and shock are serviced, but otherwise fine. So there's lots going on because 
yeah, there's lots going on in suspension. There's <laughs> lots of things and lots of factors. Um, we are assuming that you've got air suspension because air will change and depending on where you're storing your bike. Uh, I've got friends who live in Finland where it's regularly minus 10, it's often a bit colder. And yeah, you can often have your suspension suck down on a ride because the, the volume of air has been reduced because it's gone from being a toasty 21 degrees mm. to being, what is that, 30 degrees? I'm not good at maths. I'm, I'm picturing my old sort of science lessons where there's p air particles whizzing around and then when they get colder, they yeah. stop whizzing around and they get smaller. Yeah, so. exactly, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah. So that's, what's, that's one factor in your suspension is that the volume is reducing at when it's cold. So I guess a factor to work around that that may work i'm not in finland so if you're in finland or canada somewhere cold let us know your tips apart from just riding a rigid fat bike um is to air up with your bike slightly colder so there's less temperature difference between where where you are the other factor is that it's cold and your product like your forks are designed to work in kind of not quite that colder conditions so all of the rubber seals um, the oil inside is going to get more viscous. That's going to be harder to blow through the travel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's not which going to feel is a, as supple. Yeah. Uh, maybe your seals are rubber as well. They're yeah, going to be harden. a little bit cranky, yeah. aren't they? They're going to be not as supple, so there's going to be more stiction potentially. So yeah. Yeah, there's lots of uh, lots of factors, unfortunately. So which is one reason why quite a lot of fat bikers are running rigid forks. It's not because they're luddites. It's because yeah. Oh, that's a good point. I hadn't even thought about that. Ah, yeah, oh, there we go. I learned something. There. Yeah, there we go. So, um, yeah, it probably isn't you, and it's not your imagination. It is really happening, um, and it's just the sort of, like, physics that that the cold does to stuff. But yeah, get in touch if you want more tips. Uh, I feel like we should send Neil somewhere to maybe maybe Levy in Finland to do a, a snow race. Or maybe Rich, he'd love that, wouldn't yeah, he? Yeah, we'll yeah, try sure. and get them involved. So my final question is from the same guy. We just answered another quick, but it's okay. It's okay, it's good. you can more have questions double questions. Good. We absolutely allow that. So uh, XO Sevi 17 says, I have a Canyon Pathlight 6 with 75 millimeters of front suspension. I use it for road and light paths, mostly road. Um, should I lock the front suspension out when on tarmac? I like to keep it open, but my brother tells me otherwise. Uh, well, do whatever you want. Um, if, your brother, if your brother likes a lockout, let him use a lockout. If you don't like it, don't use it. Um, interestingly, I did do a video last year uh, in the spring. Uh, I'll leave a link to it in the description below on whether lockouts make a difference. And I did this on my XC bike on a climb, XC bike on a sprint, and my Enduro bike on a climb. Time. and lockout did make a difference it actually did make me faster it saved a little bit of energy um, sprinting actually made no difference whatsoever it was exactly the same um, so I don't know I think it's a little bit inconclusive as to how helpful it is if you're not at UCI World Cup level I don't think it's making a huge amount of difference but it does make a difference to comfort and psychology so my opinion is I don't know what yours is do whatever feels good for you yeah, I mean, I think maybe your brother, you just need to get him a kind of either a grip <laughs> shift lockout that's not attached to something so he can go, oh yeah, I'm locked out. Yeah. Um, because I think 75 mil, as long as you've got the sag set right, which is a whole sort of separate discussion, I feel like it will it will work fairly It'll well on the road. So yeah, and then it anyway. will be comfy. There's no argument about that. Mm. Um, so if you're doing kind of flat bar gravel, yeah, just keep it open. It's good. Yeah whatever anyway thanks for your questions and if anyone watching now has any burning questions don't forget to use hashtag ask gmd blah 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 what was that tech. again ask gmd and tech down in the comments below and we'll try and get back to you thank you